I'm assuming that all of you have got a mobile phone with you. How many want to test an application this morning on a mobile device? Three, four, five, about half of you. And the other half are here because you don't like the other topics. <laughs> okay. Right. Do you have your own applications here that you'd like to test? Or would you like to test a generic application? Do you have your own? So, own application you want to test? No, no, we don't have any. You don't have an application. So who has an application you'd like to test this morning? Anyone? Okay, none of you have your own application, one person. Does anyone else, you want to test just an application, I say please test this application. Okay, good. Right. Uh, how many of you don't have Android? So you're on iOS or Windows Phone? Okay, that's three of you. So the rest of you all got Android? Yes. Are you willing to install the Qubit software? Yes, sir. Okay. Do you have the Wi-Fi password? Yes. And you all have a, so the Wi-Fi password? Uh, let's just get to that bit. The Wi-Fi password's at the top there. I've taken that from the sign outside, so what I suggest you do is on your mobile devices, you log into the Wi-Fi, get as far as Google Play, and download the Qubix application. So you can do that in the next well, half an hour or so. And then when you get to the testing side of it, you'll already have the application installed on your devices. And all of you were here yesterday, so you know what we're talking about when I say Qubix. So the little flightless uh, New Zealand bird with an X on the end of it. Right, how many of you are involved in testing mobile applications at the moment, or in developing and testing mobile applications? One brave soul. Two? Anyone not involved in testing mobile applications? So I know where I'm starting from. Okay, about half of you. So um, I can start fairly slowly on this topic and try and build on it. Here I have about 30 to 40 slides. Uh, I'm going to try and give you some work to do so that you're involved. I have another three or 400 slides on the topic. So there might be times I end up packing my slides to bring some material in based on your feedback and um, questions you ask me. Uh, I hope that's okay. And the corollary of that is if you don't ask me questions, then it's going to be hard for me to know what's missing in the slides. So please, all the way through the session, Put your hand up, ask a question, if I haven't sort of given you a natural opportunity, and I'll then do what I can to help you with the testing aspects of things. Does everyone who needs it got the Wi-Fi password now? Anyone need it? Does it work? Okay, so I happen to be logged in through the room account, so I'm using a different way of doing this stuff. Okay, let's just go back to the beginning. Um, Right at the beginning, like yesterday, you're free to use my slides. Um, you're free to ask for a copy. I've already sent yesterday's slides to uh, Naresh and asked him to put them on the website. But if you want them, you just ask them for me. The only condition of these slides is that if you do end up modifying them, you, you make that work available for other people. So that means if you're in your own company, by the way, and you modify my slides, you're also obligated to make them available publicly. Just a little warning for you. Um, this is a legal licensing agreement that gives you pretty much any permissions, providing you conform with that. Oh, okay. okay, well, for some reason my computer's just hung beautifully. Alright, you know when the good days happen? This isn't the good day. This is the 8 seconds. Press the power button now. Press the power button. And thankfully, it's a Mac, and a good day of Mac boots in about 10 seconds. So we'll see if the Mac comes back, we'll see if the world's happy, and if not, we'll be doing a much more interactive workshop with no slides at all, which would be fine by me, but perhaps not <coughs> comfortable for you. So it's um, got the grey scheme of death for those Windows people who've never seen a Mac sitting there doing um, not very much at all. Yes, good question. Uh, no, there isn't. So, the four or five people who haven't got Android, one of the good things about being in a workshop is I want you to work with other people. 
So it's a good opportunity for you to compare and contrast user interfaces and um, see the differences. If we're testing across platform applications such as, say, Twitter, then we'd be comparing and contrasting the functionality. And when I was in Estonia doing some testing, and we tested with Skype, and we found there were massive differences between the different applications. So different that the team didn't actually recognize their own application. Um, unfortunately, I've lost the sound guy. I'm getting echo. Do you get echo? Okay. All right. I apologize when the sound guy comes back. I'll see if I can get to tune it out. I have now a, a, my little login. See? Something's happening. It'll do with the Mac recovery. Uh, right. Go on. Yes, I'd like to install the Cubix app if you don't mind. It doesn't ask for much in terms of permissions. Can you tune out the echo or is it, this is the best we're going to get? Please, Simon. Like. Can you tune the echo out? I get a lot of echo in the, the speakers. If, if just to reduce the echo if you can, I'm not sure it's low or not. Can you still hear me in the back? Yeah. Yes. Right, okay, let's live with that. Right, here's PowerPoint. Good, okay, we're this far. Right, thanks for holding with me then for the last few minutes. So the first thing is we're at an Agile conference, so hopefully you've heard this magic buzzword of Agile testing. This work is sort of fairly long in the tooth now. Go on. Oh, um, well, Mr. Can you do the focus thing? I think it's the main <laughs> You think it's just a slide, quality? It is. It's All right. It's I apologize for the, the, the lack of quality of the slide. So what we've got here at the top is we've got business facing, and at the bottom we've got technology facing. So testing tries to address these two different directions. The business side of it is, is the feature useful? Is it what we're trying to deliver? Technology is, is the implementation working well for us? So we need to consider both aspects in terms of testing. And then we've got the other sort of left and right sides. We've got critiquing the product, so asking questions of the product, and then using tests to support the team. And uh, Lisa Crispin basically took this concept based on some earlier work from people in the Agile community and created the concept of quadrants. And her book on Agile testing is a good start in terms of understanding testing. And what we can see here is that basically it's supported by automated testing, uh, up the top, the quadrant two, which is where we're looking at supporting the team of business facing, we may be a mixture of automated and manual testing. Um, if we're looking at cleaning the product, then it tends to be manual or interactive testing. And then down here, with performance, load, security, uh, testing, etc., we're looking at tool based testing and test automation. I'll try and cover most of these uh, during this workshop with you, uh, albeit that we won't be doing a lot of performance or security testing. Um, today, because it's impractical to do it in a short workshop. Uh, do you know how automated testing and tool-based testing are working? Um, uh, tool-based testing could be things like using uh, uh, analysis tools that would scan the code base and look for common problems, oh. for instance. Performance testing, you may be driving an automated test, but you also then need some sort of instrumentation or other information that you get from like, response times. So, does that answer your question? Yeah. Yeah, okay. Um, I do apologize, it looks like my Mac. Does anyone have a computer? Because <laughs> this is not going well. Um, it's hung at 5 minutes and 11 seconds again. I thought like it was a combination of. Yeah, I think we're going to have to do this. Um, so, I apologize for this. You want a Mac? Well, it's the first time it's died like this on me, and it is two years old, but it was working yesterday. Just repeating the word twice. Yeah, it was going to take me just a minute. Are you the new Mac Power? Should have Mac. Okay, but it should last until the battery. Uh, well, no, it's just that these are the new uh, 5 pin.
Right, how do you intend to install the cubits? Who's got cubits installed? All right, so while we're sorting this out, um, how many of you all got into access? Have any of you got, so you've got no computers on that table, no computers here. Um, okay, what I'd like you to do then, just for the next five minutes, I'd like you to um, explore the cubits user interface, uh, initially in English, um, you'll find this little menu structure. Don't worry too much about downloading a ZIM file, or that, that you should find the initial point is it asks you a little sort of help page that will get you to download a small file, which is called Ray Charles. Um, so basically just explore the user interface, first in English, and I'd like you to change the settings to your preferred language, and do the similar testing in terms of um, the, your language. For about 10 minutes, we'll hopefully give you time to get the um, material copied across here. Sorry? Yes, it has a little link in the middle of it. And if you are willing to install ZIM file, the Ray Charles one is 2.4 megabytes. So it's tiny and can download even on a slow Wi Fi connection. You're welcome to pick a larger one. Uh, Hindi, if it's available, it's about 700 megabytes. So on the hotel Wi Fi, that may well take the rest of today. So you probably want to have a smaller one than that. You shut your computer down because of a problem. Yes, I did. I don't know if anyone else would like the slides, it's a backup, 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 they're here. So you're very welcome to take them now and put them in your computer just in case I killed someone else's computer, which actually would be quite bad. Oh, do you have, you don't have PowerPoint on here, do you? Oh, that's fine, it should work with preview, hopefully. Can you, I'm back up, aren't I? Right, well, how's your laptop? Okay, so I don't know if there's a curse here, and I apologize, of course, because this is affecting the workshop, um, but uh, I'm back to my laptop. We'll see if he's gonna continue, and if not, then we should probably just realize that today's not a good day for us and go and do something else. 
Um, one of the things we're trying to do in terms of Agile then is to reduce the feedback time and the feedback cycles. Uh, with mobile applications, this tends to be a much longer feedback cycle than it would be for uh, applications using web-based technologies. Uh, for instance, we've got to be able to deploy the software onto the devices. Uh, we've got the whole challenges of dealing with our users who are typically a long way from us. And the fact that the users have much more power now in terms of providing feedback. They have the upper hand. Um, so in the old days when we sold software, if they complain, they complain through channels that we controlled for the most part. With social media, people may complain on social media. But now the app store rating is probably the thing that's most important to companies in terms of the success and viability of their applications. So one of the first requirements for us is to look at uh, continuous integration, which is a development process um, which helps us to take work done by any of the developers, and typically in development teams, you've got more than one developer working on an application, and to be able to integrate that work into a cohesive whole of the software. And given that about half of you haven't much experience of this, uh, I've just got uh, the, what I call the raw ingredients. So the first thing, of course, is we have some sort of source code, and we have a code repository. Now, scarily, I still meet developers who don't use source control, uh, and they're just working on the local machine, and sort of wishful thinking hope that when they build in their IDE, everything will be fine, that they press the magic button, and it copies the software onto their phone or whatever, but not realizing that they risk losing everything. Um, as we've just seen, it's very easy for computers to turn against you at any moment. And particularly if you're on these modern laptops like my one, which has SSD. So one of the characteristics of SSD is it goes from working fine to catastrophic failure. And normally it does it fairly quickly. It's normally a sort of, it's not working, but it should be okay. It's not working, I've just rebooted, end of disk. <laughs> so you learn to make backups. So. Anyway, I'm having a good reminder of that today, so thank you, Apple. <laughs> anyway, so we put our code in a source control repository. Git tends for the flavor of the month these days. Now, just because the code appears in the source repository doesn't mean that anything happens unless there's a trigger or something that says, OK, new code has arrived. I'm going to do something. And doing something then says that I'm going to run a build tool. Um, for those working on iOS, you're using something like Xcode build. Visual Studio, I haven't done builds for five years or more in Visual Studio, but it always used to have ways to be able to do command line builds. So something similar. Um, Android, certainly we've got techniques to do this. We run everything from the command line, either using the Ant system or the Gradle system. And that basically takes all the source code, it takes the build files, and says, right, I'm going to build the application. And it kind of dumps it in an area of memory on the hard disk. Uh, so, what happens with it next? Well, we've built it. So we've kind of done the integration side of it, but we probably want to run some automated tests against it, which means we have to write these automated tests. Those also go into the source code. They also go into the um, code repository. They also trigger updates when they're written uh, and are built, and then the tests are run. We then have some sort of runtime environment, and there are two main runtime environments. There's uh, things called emulators and things called simulators. When you're working on iOS development, then you're actually running in something called a simulator, which means it looks like an iPhone or an iPad, but it isn't. It's basically Intel software running on the Intel chipset, which happens to be your MacBook. The real device is running an ARM-based chipset, so it's entirely different compilation processes, uh, different compilers, different deployments, different code that's running at execution time. For Android, we're running in something called an emulator, which means it's actually emulating the whole operating system. So your software isn't supposed to know the difference between being on an Android um, virtual machine or in a physical device. And then, of course, we have the devices, which we then connect up, perhaps using a cable, perhaps connecting over Wi-Fi, so we deploy the software to that. And when we're looking at sort of agile projects at scale, so we're trying to do more than one device at once, one of the big challenges is how do we run the tests on a tablet and on a phone, and how do we run it on many devices and on the go. Android has much better support for running the tests in parallel across devices. There are a number of open source and commercial products that enable you to deploy in parallel, run the tests in parallel, and then get the feedback uh, at the same time. So I talked about the time to use of feedback, and one of the first challenges for us is where are the latencies? 
where do the delays happen? So what I'd like to do is um, um, ask any of you to suggest where are delays in the process of getting feedback on a mobile application. Given about half of you already working with them, I'm hoping you've got some practical experiences. And then after that, I've got my impressions, my slide on the different sections. But I'd like you to have a little uh, suggestions on where you think delays happen. So I'll take you from the beginning. Here I am. I'm a programmer. You're the programmer. So you've written the code and you've pressed Control Save or Command Save or whatever it is your favorite IDE. So you want to build the code and you want to test it. So where are the delays and how long does it take? Any suggestions from people? From the network. So we try to get the software to, to get feedback in terms of testing. So you think one delay is in the network. How long do you think the delay is in the network? Is it a millisecond, um, a second, <coughs> 10 seconds a minute, an hour, a day? Okay, yeah, so let's just get to your suggestion of the time and then we'll come on to the build size. Maybe, maybe one minute. So maybe a minute's taken by the network. Now, personally, I don't often see the network as a major factor because normally it's me with a high-speed network. If I need the network, I'm connecting the phone or whatever I'm deploying to locally or running the emulator or simulator locally. But we may have a minute there. And then you say, said the build times. Build the build size. So. And can you give me an idea of the build size that you're working with? So actually I haven't worked on the mobile application, but one of my friends is working on that. And, and there was recently a site which actually developed and which you know, which can be accessed on an Android device as well as on a laptop or a tablet. And they had very huge image sizes which they had compressed. And even after compressing it was like maybe eight or nine MB per size and they had like some thirty thousand images which they actually uploaded. So it was a site where it was a site where actually you can design uh, or you know you can actually uh, uh, this there was like a, a person actually who actually uh, you know uh, like uh, does the interior of maybe a hotel or a room or maybe you know apartments also they had big image size and that actually got the delay. So that they were packaging a large amount of data. You said the data is about eight or nine megabytes, and that was adding to the delay times. Okay. The Curix application is a cross-platform development environment. So when you check out the code from um, SourceForge or GitHub, you basically get a lot of code, you run a configure file at the beginning, uh, and then that says, okay, I'm going to build Android, and I'm going to build iOS, not iOS, sorry, I'm going to build OS X, or I'm going to build just the desktop ones, or just the servers, or just Android. So that takes maybe about 30 seconds. Then run the dependencies, and one of the first thing it does, it goes to the network and says, I need this little file, I need this little file, I need this little file. And it combines lots of sort of C++ libraries into the build. I was trying to do this last week when I was in Sri Lanka, and it took me the whole weekend. Because basically we go out on the hotel network, the hotel network wasn't that reliable, sometimes I had to go and back log in again. So it took the whole weekend just to get the build process to that point. But even on a fast machine, on a fast network, it would take maybe 10 minutes for that. Uh, anyone else got any suggestions? So we've, we've built the code. Now what? Are we testing yet? So what else is between the two? We need to get feedback if it's really working and it's not just the build. That's right, we need feedback. So we've got to start a build. So what happens between build and feedback? So we need to install it on some device. Yeah, OK, so we've got deployment. And how long does deployment take? Well, a few seconds in one case. Any other suggestions for why we might have a different time? A minute or two. A minute or two. Why would it be a minute or two rather than a couple of seconds? It takes download time and then storage and then copies and then download time usually takes for eight MB to play it took a minute. Yeah, okay. So you're talking about downloading over a network. Yeah. So if you're doing it over Wi Fi, yes, I could see it being a minute. The wire will be faster. Yes. On Android over USB on this, which one, on a good day, this is an i7 processor with 16 gigs of RAM. So copying over USB 3, it still downloads about 3 megabytes a second. So if it's a 10 meg application, it's 3 seconds. If it's 100 megs, we're looking at more like 30 seconds. So a couple of minutes. 
Okay, so we get the software onto the device, but what if we're using an emulator or a simulator? We may actually have to start that running, and that could easily take a couple of minutes. So, again, we're looking at Agile, and you're probably familiar with this whole concept of you run the tests, and you maybe even do test first or test driven development. We're now looking at minutes for feedback. Now, minutes is long enough that you get bored, go and get a cup of coffee or whatever your favorite drink is, go and check your Facebook status. Oh, come back an hour later. Has the build finished? Oh, it failed with an error. Never mind. So, we're looking at that sort of stuff. So here are some suggestions then. We've got the build times, it's already been mentioned. Uh, for QX, it's long enough now that I give up. I no longer wait for the automated test to run because it does this whole sort of stuff in the background. And typically it takes never less than a couple of minutes on my machine. It can easily take 10, 20, or even an hour if it's something I haven't built for a while. It's downloading the extra software. Uh, we've got the um, what I'm calling the um, commissioning runtime environment, which means getting the runtime environment set up, which could be a phone, it could be an emulator or a simulator, and getting the software on it ready for us to use. And with many of the Android test automation frameworks, you're actually installing two pieces of software. You're installing the app itself, and then the test automation is actually a, a headless application. So you can't see it in the user interface, you can't click on it, but it's actually an app that's running there on the device. When we're looking at iOS test automation, what happens is we typically modify the binary the source code, in fact, and then we build a modified binary and deploy that. And it actually connects over TCP IP and HTTP requests as a way the test automation works. So all that needs to be set up at this point. Uh, deployment, we talked a little bit about that, and in fact, it can take a little bit of time over a network. When you're doing test automation with um, iPads and iPhones, very often you're doing that over Wi-Fi. So it may sound silly, but that means that your computers need to be on the same logical network. So if you're running a desktop computer connected over Ethernet, it has to be on the same network as the Wi-Fi network. Otherwise, they can't see each other. And the test automation relies on that communications um, for the test automation to work. Then we've got the, the whole um, App Store approval. So if you're wanting feedback from users, we're not looking at seconds anymore. At best, we're looking at hours, if you're looking at, say, Android. And in worst case, we're looking at uh, months if you're looking at Apple on a bad day, um, where they're taking a while to do the approval cycles or the reject of the feedback. And I've got lots of slides on this side of it, so if you want that material, you can also just email me or I could use it after the break. And finally, we get the feedback from the field, which is where the users are using the software, and we find things like crash dumps. Um, any of you used to put the developer consoles for Google Play or the... Um, uh, iPhone, uh, the iPhone app store. Have you ever use these things? All right. So basically, when you're an app developer, you have an account. Um, you pay for it on Apple. I mean, it's free on Android. I think it's a small amount of money on Windows Phone. That's probably about fifty or hundred dollars. And you get access to be able to upload your applications, do your screenshots, write the words about it, etc. You can then say, "I'm going to release my application." It gets released, and you get feedback saying you've had one download. You've had two downloads, you've had 10 downloads, you've had 1,000 downloads, you've got 50,000 downloads, you've got 10 million, 100 million, you know, whatever it is, number of downloads. And you start to get the feedback of your App Store rating, and for QX it's currently about 4.39 out of 5. And um, we've got about 50,000 um, downloads and about 35,000 active installs, which means that someone hasn't removed it from the device. But what we also get is the crash information. So at the moment we've got three types of crashes coming through. And they're all exceptions. It's Java-based, so we get some sort of exception saying something went wrong, and here's a stack trace. Now, we haven't done anything special for this. It's just part of the App Store process is that the devices collect this information, send it back over the network to, uh, to Google. Google make it available to us. And similar techniques exist for all the App Stores. So you start to look through the feedback and say, oh, oh stupid me. You know, I forgot to check that it can cope with um, left to right, or sorry, right to left character sets. Okay, I'll fix the bug, I'll upload the changes. But we take a look at a long cycle time, but it still gives us the feedback. Now, I've qualified things as failure, so failure to means that we've got something like an exception, it stopped working, and defects may be that users start to get grumpy. I can't find the menu option. So, you know, it doesn't seem to do this for me anymore. You remove the feature that I used to love. Starbucks is a good example. They have a mobile app, 
right to have a customized coffee or whatever it was, and you go into a Starbucks store and say, this is my customized coffee. And they remove that from the app, and users got really grumpy, say, this was my favorite feature. But they haven't communicated that well to the users. Users wanted the old app. But unfortunately, you can't get the old app. App stores only move you forwards. They never take you backwards again. So that's an example of a defect in use. We didn't know about it if we were Starbucks. Now we need to deal with it. So moving on then to time to useful feedback in terms of interactive testing. Now this little uh, matrix um, comes from a chap called Jonathan Bach. Um, how many of you are familiar with this concept of exploratory testing? Most of you heard this buzzword. It came from a couple of people including Ken Kainer and James Bach um, who coined the phrase exploratory testing more than a decade ago. John Bach is the brother of James Bach and works in the software industry doing mainly software testing and uh, software quality. So came up with this nice little idea which is we want to maximize the testing and we want to minimize the time taken to do bug reporting and setup. So setup is getting the system ready to do the testing. Bug investigation says, okay, we found something that seems to be a problem. You know, do we have to take screenshots? Do we have to write little notes? Do we have to go and copy files off the device? Or can we continue testing? So it basically says you maximize T and you minimize the BS in uh, the testing work that we're doing. So minimizing setups, it may be that we want to email the files to the phones. For Android phones, providing you've enabled the um, developer mode, uh, then the phone will allow you to download the APK file, which is how Android apps are bundled straight onto the device. So I email it to you, you click on the little link, a couple of seconds later it's installed on your device. So it works quite well, doesn't it? Can't do this with iOS, I don't think you can do it on Windows Phone. Um, you may just be mailing someone a URL to a link to allow them to download things. And if you've ever had to type these insanely long URLs, you'll know just how nice it is to have it available to you. Having some sort of workstation, and that includes a Mac if you're working on iOS, to deploy software makes it a little bit easier. Uh, for those of you who are lucky enough to use Windows, you'll know that every time you plug a new device into Windows, it says, you know, installing device driver. And if it can't find the device driver, um, or it needs the network to get it, you're stuck until the moment comes that you get the device driver sorted. Uh, someone here has Linux. I can't remember. Yeah, you have Linux. So Linux, you have a bunch of configuration files, the custom rules. Most of the time, you don't know about this. But just occasionally, you'll find things like, um, I have a Nook with me, which is an Android tablet. And I had to edit a special file um, for Android to allow it to see it and work with it. And it's a USB INI file that's sort of hidden away, but you have to find it, add a little hex code, and that enables me to use the device. Similarly with the Mac, on a good day the Mac just works, on the bad day it doesn't. Um, and then we've got this whole concept of being able to download the apps for testing for your build server. If you can make that, the builds available on the build server, then someone can just log in and say a mobile phone, download the latest APK, put it on the device, and then use that. So minimize bug investigation. Stupid, simple things like screenshots. Um, I still travel with the camera, um, and one of the things I do with the camera is take pictures of phone screens and say, look, this is what's wrong with it. Because it's very hard to tell someone. Let's say I'm working with a developer on QX who's in Switzerland, and I say, look, someone in India has had a problem with this. I say, good luck. You know, what can I do about it? Oh, here's a screenshot of it. OK, well, I've got a clue. And then even better, if you're using the one that's from the App Store, like you all are now, uh, if it crashes on your device, then providing you allow it to send the crash information, we'll actually get that in the developer console a few hours later, so we can then go and investigate the problem and deal with it. From an interactive testing perspective, learning how to use the logs is really useful. So with iOS, it's part of Xcode. So anyone working on an iOS application, you need Xcode installing your device. So you're looking at sorry, 5, 10 gigabytes of content, plus all the attendance setup fiddling around with Xcode. Android, you're using a client called ADB, which is part of the SDK tools. Um, some people have found enterprising ways just to package ADB so you can do this, and a few other tools. Um, and then we've got to remember that just because we've got a problem today, so here we are on Saturday, um, you may be reporting bugs in QX, which is very kind of you, but it may take a week or two before someone looks at it. So all the context around it needs to be captured um, as elegant as we can do that. 
So in terms of maximizing testing then, there's a couple of people, Jonathan Cole and a company called Mulia, who are based in Bangalore, um, who've come up with heuristics, um, and these are the heuristics. And first of all, I'll explain what a heuristic is. So a heuristic is a fallible uh, guideline that may be wrong, but it tends to be useful to people. So a heuristic for me might be, if I'm wandering around a city, and I don't know the city, find the railway station or follow the river, because the river will normally go somewhere close to the centre of the city. So occasionally I end up going the wrong direction, but not very often, and so far it's worked well for me. So these heuristics, each letter stands for a form of testing, I'll give you an example shortly, uh, and helps to prompt our head and think, oh, okay, what the heck's the I mean? Oh yes, yeah, so that means this, so let's go and look at the I aspect of testing. And one of the other topics I'm dealing with at the moment is this concept of anti-fragile. So anti-fragile stops us from end up being in a fragile situation where things are going wrong and, and, and software's breaking or the processes are breaking. So from an agile perspective, we need to be able to adapt to the context, what's happening at the moment. And just because the context has changed, we shouldn't just give up. So we need to find a way to keep going, and these heuristics help us to keep going. Um, does anyone know about the Black Swan book? OK, just a couple of you. So the Black Swan book is uh, written by uh, someone who traded stock in America, and he said, one of the worst problems we have to deal with as a society is the problem that happens very infrequently, but when it happens, it changes everything. So the crash of the banking crisis in America in 2008 affected the whole world. No one knew when to predict it, they didn't know the scope of it, the magnitude, and so his book was written from that perspective. And his newest book is on anti-fragile, which is saying that things like the human body, we actually improve through stress and load. So my legs get stronger because I do exercise. And if we don't do exercise and don't use our bodies, they get weaker. Make sense? Okay. So the challenge is, can we write software that also improves as it's used? So that's the concept, and it's kind of just starting to come into the agile communities. Um, so that's what I'm talking about. So this is the mnemonic for uh, mobile app testing. What I'll have to do for you, because it's impossible to read on the screen, which I apologize, um, is look at the, um, the web URL for you when we do this in a few minutes. Um, so what we're looking at is this thing called cop flung gun, which is enabling us to remember different aspects of the testing. So for instance, C is for communications, orientation, and platform. So communications, we've got an application like QX. Most of you have downloaded QX, and one chap at the back says, do I need to install the ZIM file? Well, if you install the ZIM file, where does it come from? It isn't on your device, so it's using the network. So one way you could test it, if you think about communications, is what happens if I put the phone into flight mode? Disable the Wi-Fi. What does the application do? Does the application have a nice sort of error message say, I think I've noticed the Wi-Fi is not there, Please can you enable Wi-Fi and then try to download the file? Or does it fail with an exception saying, you know, no network error? Or even worse, error in file network.cpp. You know, page, page, page cannot be displayed. It's a great error message. Uh, in fact, the application Kiwix on Android has something called a web view as the main content of the display. So most of the screen is actually a web view. Now, this became important because the platform changed, uh, changed with Android. Uh, most of you got Android phones? How many of you got a KitKat device? KitKat is the operating system. Okay, so that's Android 4.4. So, how many of you got Jelly Bean devices? Most of you. ICS, Ice Cream Sandwich. Okay, I feel sorry for you. Um, and then Gingerbread, which is 2.3. So, a couple of people got Gingerbread. So, Gingerbread's on the really cheap, low end phones the ones that you can buy for sort of $30. ICS came out a couple of years ago. It normally means you bought a specialist device that no one supports anymore, with rare exceptions. Jelly Bean is probably still shipping on about a third of the devices, and KitKat is now on more than 40% of the devices. So one of the fundamental changes that happened with KitKat is the development team finally changed the web view. And they changed it from one that was based on WebKit to one that was based on the Chromium browser. Now, it might sound silly. I'll try and show you this interactively. Uh, so this is QX, and I think this will be in Hindi. If I pinch and zoom, can you see I'm pinching and zooming? 
So with the older WebKit-based browser, what would happen when I pinched and zoomed is the text would automatically reflow and resize. Now it doesn't. So when KitKat first came out about a year ago, this was a 1% problem. You know, 1% of users had this. So a lot of people in the world were scratching their heads and saying, dear Google, you should fix this. You know, you fools. How could you do this to us? Well, there's some good reasons why Google did it. It's to do with the standardization of web browsers. So there's basically a, a long thread on one of the Google bugs saying, will not fix, working as intended. So what do you do from a development perspective? The, act of, you know, the, the developers, Android, say, we're not going to do this anymore for you. Good luck. So there's article after article after article and posts on Stack Overflow and stuff. Anyone trying to fix this? They say, inject JavaScript, do this, do that, set it into compatibility mode, blah, 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 blah. No one's yet fixed the problem. So we've gone from a 1% problem to a 40% problem because these days more and more people are getting newer devices, which include KitKat. So the problem is getting more important to us, and that's a platform problem in terms of these heuristics. Uh, for those of you who don't know, if you go to the android.com site, um, Google updates statistics about every two weeks on all the different screen sizes, all the different operating system versions, uh, and a bunch of other useful in criteria. That means you can go and look there and say, ah, oh, we've noticed that now there's 40% of our users, or 40% of the users in the world are now on KitKat. So we want to make sure that we've got at least one KitKat device to test with. Oh, we've noticed more and more people are using the extra high density screens. We better make sure we've got at least one device with an extra high density screen for our testing. And we may want to test on that first. And now, I'm sorry to say, we don't test on the ICS device first because there's 3% still using those. So sorry, but you're also using Linux. You're clearly a geek. You, know, you can probably fix the bugs in our code. Make sense? All right. So we can use information that's already available to us from sites such as Google to help guide us in terms of what we're trying to do. Um, at the bottom of here is the very, very long URL. Um, that's the short URL. You'll find it fairly quickly with your favorite search engine and search for cop flung gun. And now, I'm looking around and I can see there's a laptop here, there's a laptop here, and a laptop here. And uh, hopefully a couple more people have got laptops. So would you be happy to do some testing based on cop flung gun for about 20 minutes? OK. I want to suggest then, if there's a table with two people with a laptop, whoever's got a laptop moves. For the two nice people here, if you can go and find a table without people with a laptop, then you can share the laptop. Uh, I think it's going to be the best way you can actually look at this. And what I'll do is I'll project on the screen the cop flung gun as well but it's not going to be very good because of the resolution here. Do you have any questions at this point? Uh, you have one question there, sir. Oh, you're happy. OK, thank you. So about 20 minutes then. It's uh, 11.20 according to my watch, so I'll check in with you at 11.40. Yes, so if you've got Qt installed on a device, and hopefully you have on a mobile device, yes, then I'd like you to use um, this cop flung gun and pick one of them initially. Sorry, I've got a bit of echo. Um, so if you were to pick communication, you might focus on the communication aspect. You may want to pick the orientation to do with the rotation of the screen and see what happens. You may want to look at things like notifications. So if you get updates and messages like that. Okay, thank you.
Sound right? Okay. Okay. So you have 20 minutes of testing using this uh, heuristic uh, Kopfland gun. Um, if you don't mind, uh, briefly sort of sharing whether you think it's useful or not. Have you learned anything from doing it? Um, and any concerns or suggestions you might have for doing something different uh, in addition to this or instead of this? So perhaps if I ask uh, the, the two of you who are sitting here at the front, you've used the heuristic for 20 minutes. Do we have a mic, by the way? Hello, phone people. Hello. Do we have a mic? See, mobile phones are addictive. Hello. Hello. Right. Thank you. So, thoughts on using a heuristic, and in particular this one, for testing mobile apps? I think it's pretty uh, exhaustive and thorough uh, than what I initially thought it would be. Like going through each point, they have like covered a whole lot of stuff, so which is new to me. And I think most of this stuff should be automated because it's very uh, would be very challenging to go through it each single time. Yeah. Maybe. After you build a single feature, if you have to test all these things, it's, it's very exhausting. And uh, one thing I like about this heuristic is, uh, while you're testing your application, uh, you have a focused uh, approach uh, of covering that particular uh, heuristic first and then going to the other thing. If you just go through this, you have an exhaustive list of test cases to be covered. Yes, so you have an extensive list of test cases. I would suggest a, a heuristic like this would give you enough to test for between an hour and several days. Yes. And the several days is having lots of different devices and testing in different contexts. But it's enough to run through fairly quickly and think, okay, what does that do in terms of communication? What sort of problems do I get if I play around with the communication or change the settings um, or expense, ex uh, experiment with the gestures? So you can sort of spend five minutes on each and work through this list fairly quickly also actually going to spend a bit more time focusing on different areas. Would anyone else like to comment? Uh, we can pass the mic back. So actually, I have been developing the app for the last six months, and we'll be releasing it next month. And I came from a web-based background, never knew what mobile development is about. All I knew is I use mobiles and I use apps, but never developed an app. So what I learned from this uh, diagram is uh, something to do with how an app should be designed, what should be considered while designing app. It does not serve as a testing heuristics, but I think if you follow some of these rules when designing the app, because what happens is that an app is about communicating an information to the user. We should not over communicate at, at the same time, we should not under communicate. We don't have the liberty of a big screen like a laptop in case of a mobile. So what we communicate to the user has to be really precise. And these heuristics uh, to some extent help me understand what are shortcomings in the app that uh, my team has developed. Yes, uh, thank I you. I had a different perspective uh, when going through this diagram, so it really helps. But at the same time, I feel uh, it doesn't talk about anything related to functionality. What is the value that it adds to the end user? Uh, but I don't know if that is really the scope of uh, this guide. So a good point. Um, and one that I want to build on is that no heuristic will enable you to do all the testing. So just because you've done this particular one doesn't mean you can stop testing now. And it doesn't really talk about anything like automation. So earlier on, you mentioned about it would be great to automate all this. Well, how do you automate things like gestures? How do you automate the observation that the user interface is no longer working as the user would like it? So it may be technically correct. It may still have the elements there, but it looks ugly. Or they've got to scroll left and right too much to read the text. So I, I think you were testing in portrait mode. And basically, the, half the screen was just the sort of big gray nothingness and the text is all squashed across on the right. So could we improve the layout of it? Automation won't tell you that. So the interactive human testing really does help. Now, someone was testing on a particular phone and said to me, how do I report a bug? Because he'd noticed that the menus, the little stars and stuff at the top, changed from landscape mode to portrait mode. And it went from sort of five different icons to three different icons. Was it you, sir? Yes. Now, I've never seen this bug before. 
I have no idea what phone you're using. Um, and I've used Kiwix on plenty of phones. So here you see some of the importance of diversity of devices. Because I think there's a table back there. Everyone's using a Samsung phone. They all look identical. So you could all be testing in parallel, but um, you're not going to find the bugs that he found simply by having a different device. And then over here we had a, a 2.1 Android device. So um, old as an operating system that Google Play doesn't support 2.1 devices. Google have publicly stated the minimum they supported was 2.2 um, because so few devices use that anymore. And there is a way to install the software, the Kiwix software, from the developer side, but we wouldn't expect many users um, of 2.1 devices to want to do that. So it's these sort of problems that it's worth knowing about. And furthermore, if you're shipping your app on Google Play, there's no point testing our 2.1 device because they can't get to it. So once you know that, it saves you a little bit of time when you're testing. Uh, any other comments? Yes. Um, if you pass them, oh, go and get the mic first. Uh, can you just get to this gentleman first? He was uh, before you. He has the mic, does have 90% of the power, though. <laughs> so I found this guide way too exhaustive. But this is actually very useful for the regression testing. But for the security testing, or, or say for a story testing, I would not use this guide as is. What I do is I'll, I'll, I'll uh, do the exploratory testing and find which category it falls in. So that, that this information, okay, this uh, bug falls in user function or something like that, this would help me in triaging the bugs. But I'll not start, my approach would be different. One would be bottoms up, another would, would be top down, top down and bottom up. So for, I'm, I'm being repetitive, but uh, say for uh, regression, I'll see, look, look, go through this guide, go through the feature, I mean category, and do the regression. But exploratory, I'll do the testing first and then fit in what category it falls. Okay, thank you. I'm going to pass the mic over to this gentleman. And I'll use this as the last feedback unless anyone's really burning to say something. Uh, nothing but just feedback. Uh, we've had an app out for about a year and a half, uh, and I found a defect right now. Okay, thank you. So, found a bug in an app that's been shipping for a, a year and a half. Good. Uh, because of my laptop playing up a little bit, I apologize. We're well behind in the materials. So, before I forget, um, I'll make the, the slides available. I have another several hundred slides available on topics, so you're very welcome to email me and say, hey, Julian, please send me the extra slides, uh, and I'm happy to send them to you. They're all under the Creative Commons agreement, which means you can use them on a share-alike basis and give them to your friends, colleagues, etc. So I'm going to just uh, skip through um, very, very quickly. I've got about two minutes left to say these are the topic areas I want to cover, and you can pick them up later. There are videos, by the way, of me talking about these topics that you'll find online. So things like testability helps um, make it easier for us to test. And that testing um, could be in terms of the interfacing, so how easy I interact with the application, or it could be in terms of how easily I obtain the information back from the application. Uh, one of my favorite examples, and I think someone was suffering from this at this conference, is when you have a user interface with a username and password, and I'm testing you know, whether it um, correctly handles someone mistyping a username and password combination. Typically, what the app will say is, the combination of username and password um, doesn't match our records. Please retry. In the old days, people used to say, you've mistyped your password, or we don't recognize your username. But the trouble with that is that um, hackers realize very quickly that oh, I've got the username right, now I've just got to guess the password, and use software to very quickly try many different passwords, uh, the most common one being password, or football team names, or pet names, or whatever it is. And then, you know, with a program, you can do this 10 million, 100 million times a second if you're running on high-speed computers. So what the application does, it says, the first time you mistype the username and password, I'll just display the dialog box and say, you know, please try again. But if you do it wrong the second time, I'm going to wait 0 0.1 of a second. Now, a human doesn't really perceive 0 0.1 of a second as any time at all. But for a computer program trying to do it a million times a second, now we've really slowed it down, haven't we? The third time we get it wrong, it might wait two seconds. The fourth time, it might wait five seconds. So if we're testing the functionality of this sort of um, login screen, 
we may, from a testing perspective, want to know what algorithm is being applied. It's doing the back-off algorithm. And by the way, it's at stage three, which is where we're now doing this incremental back-off. Stage four might be the application shuts down for 10 minutes, for instance. So testability means that we can see this information inside the application as if it was speaking to us and saying, oh, look, now this is what I'm actually doing at the moment. Because there are going to be rich bugs in that area. So in terms of design of testability, we can use hooks and write code in the application to make it easy to get the information and easy to do test automation. Um, I wrote a paper that's published on the Logigear website. Logigear is a testing company about test automation interfacing that goes into lots of detail about the whole interfacing challenges. Um, so one of the challenges then in terms of Agile, and yesterday we were arguing a little bit about uh, velocity and story points and stuff at the conference. So one of the challenges is to be able to provide value in terms of the application. Where does testing fit into this? And in terms of software development, the cost isn't the cost of writing the software. The cost is the life of the software over how many years it's been available. And the gentleman there um, said his app's been shipping for a year and a half. So when the developers wrote the code, it was 2013, wasn't it? Summer 2013. Or maybe they wrote it even earlier. It could even be 2012. The code is still there. So we look at the cost of supporting it and updating the application with iOS 8 and new devices. You, you can't just sit on your code base and say, I shipped it two years ago. It should still work on all devices. It's got to still be updated and modernized. So we can actually find that the initial cost of development may be dwarfed by the maintenance costs. Um, and we have some trade-offs to think about here. And testing may have some impact of this. So uh, one big question is when and where to spend money on testing. Uh, Novoda is a smallish um, company in London, and uh, I think they're now in Berlin, a couple of other places in Europe. And they basically develop Android applications. And they quote to lots of companies, some big that you've heard of, some small companies, and say, well, we can develop the application for you. This is how much work we think it's going to be and how much it's going to cost you. And we have price A, which is no automated tests, and price B, which is with automated tests. So this price is you know, whatever, it's one lakh. This one is 1.6 lakh. So it's about 60% more. Now, as a client, you know, which one do you pick? You know, one lakh, 1.6 lakh. Well, we're in India, aren't we? So <laughs> I can tell the answer. We're going to negotiate me down and say, I want that for one lakh. <laughs> but nonetheless, you know, what they found out is that you don't recoup the money, the extra 60% of the costs, on the first version of the app. You actually recoup it as you're iterating around, as that gentleman is doing, and saying, OK, we've got the app, we're shipping the app, we need to update it. And we're running automated tests. It reduces the sort of internal approval cycle. You know, do we think we've got a build that's good enough to put in the app store from several days, in their case, to about a day. So there's still some interactive testing being involved. But the automated tests help them to do the testing faster um, and get the feedback sooner. Um, I'll skip the, the details there because of the time. Um, one thing I want to mention is that testing isn't the only way of getting the answers. Um, in mobile, as in other, the other worlds, we've now got a number of specialist companies who will basically say, give us your software, we'll send it to our team of crack testers from around the world and get them to give you some feedback. Uh, and you may give some guidelines and say, I want you to test, say, using cop and gun, or I want to test based on looking for functionality. I want you to test on different devices. I want someone who speaks fluent Arabic or fluent Hebrew to do the testing, because we don't. So you may be doing this sort of testing. Um, learning to look at the logs. Um, typically, you can plug in whatever your device is um, using USB cables. That's an Android tablet. And we've got an iOS uh, ipad -y thing here. So plug it in and use the relevant software tools and look at the logs. And what you'll find out is that all the, log, all the applications on your device are very chassis. They're all writing in there. So if you're using, say, Gmail or Google Maps or Facebook or Twitter, they're all writing to the system log. So even though you're focusing on your testing, you'll learn things about the apps you're using. And then it'll give you some idea of how can we improve the logs that we're writing from our mobile application so that we can then do a better job of diagnosing problems in future. I mentioned crash dumps. Crash dumps are really useful to help understand from a programmer's perspective. We ended up here, and here is where it went wrong. What was all the stuff that was happening above it? You know, how did we get to here? Look at the crash dump, and it gives us a better idea of where the problems are. 
Um, analytics uh, is used a lot for marketing. There are tens of companies who make analytics available, Google Analytics being one example you've probably heard of. And you have a little library that you sort of include in your main application. And when the application is shipped, it will typically be sending extra little messages from the application uh, under control of the programmers who wrote the extra code and say, send a little message for this thing. Um, and it'll do that when the network's available. And that's collected by, say, Google or maybe your servers. And we then review this information. And it'll give us some good ideas of how the application is actually being used in the field. So since you showed me your application was to look at rotary clubs, wasn't it? Yeah. And the distance from where we are now. Maybe you'd have analytics that says, by the way, we've noticed that users are doing searches and they're searching and ordering by distance. Or they're searching and ordering by feedback. So people prefer this one or don't like this. Or they're searching based on price. You know, maybe you have to pay to go to some and not to others. So that might be useful in terms of looking at extra features uh, or redesigning the user interface, because perhaps there's something that you think is more popular, but the users are having trouble getting to it. So you put it on the home screen of the application. So analytics can help that. With app stores, then users can very easily provide feedback through the app store. But one of the challenges with that is when someone says something bad about the application, it stays around for a long time. So some of the smarter companies are now saying, what we'll do is we'll have a little in-app feedback, and that comes directly to us. So it bypasses the app store, uh, and we get the feedback immediately. Also, we can have more flexibility in the data we ask people to provide. And maybe you can ask them to take a picture, and they'll take a picture and send this as long with the feedback. So you can use that as another way of complementing testing. Uh, this is the Android uh, UI automation viewer tool. Uh, there's something similar in iOS instruments that allows us to see the screen structures. You have a question? I have a question too. Uh, can you just grab the mic? So uh, before uh, the app goes into the App Store, uh, does the App Store does a validation of the app? Does the App Store does a validation? Uh, it does some validation. It depends on which App Store we're dealing with. So in the early days of um, Google Play, um, or what we used to call Android Market, the, the, there didn't seem to be much validation taking place, whereas with the Apple App Store, there seemed to be a lot of stuff happening. And there's also some carrier app stores. So say T-Mobile has an app store, and they may go through their own approval process. So typically, each app store will have a series of internal guidelines that says, check for these things. Make sure you can log in with the apps, and maybe have a human being actually using the application. And sometimes with the app stores, you now have to send them, or at least it's wise to send them, here's a login account to try the application. So they can then try it and make sure that the app doesn't do bad things. So if we look at um, a sort of fairly blunt example, the app doesn't include pornography if it's being rated as mild. So how can they test that? We, it's very hard to automate that. So get someone to log in and they do that as part of the App Store approval cycle. Um, Apple published a fairly extensive guideline on the App Store uh, approval process. And I think similarly Windows, uh, with Windows Phone, provides very good guidelines of saying, these are the sort of things that you want to make sure you've got sorted before you send the app to us, because your app gonna, ain't going to make it through. So those guidelines are really important as part of it. And test automation tools are really good for getting screenshots. Quite often, the app stores need screenshots, uh, and you'll want them to encourage and entice users. So automation is a great way of collecting those things. So this is UI Automation Viewer. It's been in the Android, I think, since um, Ice Cream Sandwich. Um, it's either that or Jelly Bean. And what we can see here is um, a visualization of the Qubits application on a tablet. It's in portrait mode. And over here, I don't know if you can see a sort of big blue bar. That's saying that we're in a text view. And where the dice is at the top, there's a little tiny red dotted sort of square. And that's the, actually representing that dice. And that's that text view there, which has got a text link of random article. Now, why is a text link useful? Well, if we're using the um, speech audio feedback, say for a user who's got visual impairment, so they're blind, they can actually listen to it and it'll say random article. Now, if the user interface is in English, that's a very good thing to have, isn't it? Because that's what that icon does. If we change the user interface and say French, does it have that translated or not? Test automation also needs a way of interacting with the software. So maybe it's looking for that label of the element as a way of finding it. So rather than just saying blindly go across 600 pixels um, to the right and then 20 pixels down and do a click, 
which, as you probably realize, is very different if we're in portrait mode than landscape mode, because it's now over here. So that's not very robust in terms of test automation. So instead, we go for a labeled element. And for anyone who's used tools like WebDriver or Selenium for web-based test automation, you'll be familiar with this sort of stuff, I hope. Uh, and I'll repeat that these tools are available for different operating systems, so we can use it for any of them. So mobile analytics. Again, I'll be very quick on this. I think there's um, a recorded keynote of me doing this, um, this topic in Finland a couple of years ago, or Estonia. So the idea is we've got applications here. They send data for some sort of collection, some sort of database. Typically, the content is then filtered. Some, apps, uh, some of the analytics engines make sure you remove personal identifiable information, like usernames and passwords, which shouldn't be passed as part of analytics. And finally, we typically log into a web server and look at this information. Um, so we can actually do this. Uh, this is the sort of mechanics of it. So we have an app. We actually combine into it someone else's software, typically using third-party software. These days, that library is normally given as source code, so you can look at the source code and make sure you're happy with it. And that's in part because of a reaction to the industry, where this code in the early days did extra things that caused problems with privacy or used too much network bandwidth or whatever it did. So now they publish this software so you can look at it yourselves and check it. And then eventually it sends the information over. And sometimes it collects the messages and puts them all together and sends a single sort of summary message. User did 23 searches today, rather than these are the individual searches, because it reduces the amount of network traffic it sends. And we can use these sort of questions then to ask questions. This is actually work from Microsoft, uh, and they use it to look at the whole development process. So we can look at things like what's been happening in the past, so reporting, so trending defects. We've noticed a number of crashes are happening more often now. We've also noticed the number of devices with KitKat are, are going up. Is there some sort of correlation between the two? Or is it just random? Oh, it seems to be correlation. Do we think there's causation, which means this is causing that? OK, we'll go and investigate that. So analytics can help us find those sort of problems um, looking backwards. Uh, alerts are great at saying, OK, maybe we've got a new version of the app. We've just pushed the app store overnight. Maybe a new device, like an Android One device, is shipping now in India that wasn't available a couple of months ago. So we're starting to see new notifications saying something seems to be going wrong. Let's go and investigate. We may have a problem on our hands. And then we can do sort of future extrapolation prediction based on the analytics information. Um, so uh, I think, thankfully, that's it. So I'm just about on time. I think it's 12 o'clock. I'm supposed to finish. And so I'll thank you very much. Um, my contact details, I think you all have it, but it's julianharty at gmail.com. Um, you're very welcome to the slides. Uh, and I'm happy to take questions. It's your lunch break now. So thank you. Any questions? Uh, do you want to grab the mic? This is regarding QX rather than the thing. Uh, you are using the web version of Wikipedia. Why not the mobile? version of Wikipedia, which I think is, has a better layout for smaller devices. So a great question, which is, why aren't we using the mobile version of Wikipedia? The Curix project has been around a few years now, and it is the offline Wikipedia reader. And although it was done by volunteers, it was done with the support of Wikimedia Foundation. And um, we worked together at Wikimedia Hackathons for it. The Wikimedia Foundation decided they wanted to do their own application in mobile that has some similarities with the Qx application. And one of the things for the team to think about, the, the volunteer team who support Qx, is other things we can do to improve the user interface based on what's happening with other similar projects. So it's an open question and a great one to ask. And it's an example where you sometimes need to compare between products. It isn't enough just to say, well, my product meets the specifications or the requirements or whatever it is. If someone else is shipping a better product, well, that's kind of the end of your business. Now, for us, we're, we're free. You know, we give the software away. We compete against free software. So it's less of a business problem. But nonetheless, we, we want to make sure that our software is as good as it can be. Or maybe it's time for us to stop working on this, and maybe we should work on that software instead. So we may change our focus. Now, one of the things that Kirix has done is that they've now allowed you to put videos in the content. And it's a great way of packaging content 
and say, we're going to put it in this single cohesive file, so you only ship one file and all the contents inside it, and people can watch videos, etc., uh, etc. Et and if, of course, companies can use it. You can use it to distribute content to people with mobile devices, with Android devices, um, or to desktop computers. So it's a great question, not sure what the answer is, and it's good that you're comparing between the two different versions. Another question at the back. Julian, uh, you showed us the four quadrants of testing. Uh, when it comes to mobile applications, uh, what, what is your opinion on uh, quadrant four versus quadrant uh, two tests? Like, uh, would you, I'm sorry, quadrant three and quadrant two tests? Uh, would, you, would you recommend a lot of automated tests for the UI, or would you? Uh, or in your experience, have you found that exploratory testing is better? Because uh, in, in this case, I think you were doing more of exploratory testing with the, with the mnemonics. It is possible to do quite a bit of UI testing using test automation. Most of the test automation tools, both the commercial ones and the open source ones, focus on testing through the user interface. So they're interacting with elements on the user interface, such as clicking on that button, typing in that text box, whatever it is. And that automation can help us to speed up some of the feedback cycles in terms of testing mobile applications. But it doesn't tell you everything that's wrong with the user interface. And you'll find that the tests will miss more than they find. By design, you don't tell a computer to go and look for stuff it's not supposed to be looking for. So it'll only look for the stuff that you tell it to look for, and it'll only check very limited features about it. So do I see the answer appears on the screen? Yes, test passed. The fact that it's upside down, it's written white on white, that's not the problem of the automated test. That's a human problem. The human looks at it and says, I can't read this. So um, there's a talk I've done, and the, the um, slides are available online. Um, you'll find the talk eventually. Uh, my blog is blog.bettersoftwaretesting.com, which talks about the fallacies of automated tests. So you might find that useful in terms of looking at these comparisons. Um, I find that the human interactive testing is really important for mobile apps. And every time I do some sort of workshop at conferences on this, we normally find 100 plus bugs of shipping applications. So, and that's from, you know, given we've already got testing and other people have done testing these apps, we're still finding problems just by having the rich interactions of human beings. So given that our users are even richer as a population than we are, we're mainly male, you know, with some exceptions, but most people coming to conference in technology are male. Um, we tend to be the more passionate people. We care more about technology. Our users are not like this. So uh, we need to make sure we're considering the user aspects of it, which is why I look at analytics as well, um, because we're collecting data from in the field of how software is actually being used rather than how we think it's being used. Um, so I don't know if I exactly answered your question, but I've talked a little bit about GUI testing, a little bit like complementary techniques such as gathering um, information by using analytics. Thank you. Any other questions? You want to ask a question? I don't know if so. Okay. Just checking. You just might be polite. You probably are polite. All right. Thank you. I'll call it quits then. Thank you very much and thank you for bearing with me when the computer misbehaved twice and thank you for sacrificing your laptop. It's been working since, hasn't it? So, good. Thank you then.